Okay, so we will start. Uh, so this is our last uh, lecture of this course, where we will discuss uh, a bit on uh, moral machines and the moral machine experiment that was published uh, in Nature. So I'll share the screen with you now. So uh, this was a uh, paper published in uh, Nature in 2018. Uh, and uh, this was a work jointly done by the MIT Media Lab, uh, the uh, Harvard, the University of uh, British Columbia, and CNRS France. So uh, this uh, work actually like um, kind of operationalizes or quantifies some of the things that I talk, talked about in the very first lecture when I was uh, telling you about the moral dilemma that robots are going to face uh, or the ethical uh, issues that the robots are going to face um, say uh, in another um, in another decade uh, when they are going to be kind of uh, more pervasive uh, in this um, uh, in the uh, professional world okay. so uh, so the question that typically the authors you know started for and which is kind of an unanswered question for quite some, for like, I mean, nobody has even thought of this uh, type of a uh, question uh, that it could even exist before the mass proliferation of uh, different types of robots, uh, especially uh, in the context of autonomous vehicles. So the question that one wants to ask here is that you know how does an algorithm decide to distribute harm okay now say for instance consider this situation say an autonomous vehicle is about to crash okay and it cannot find a trajectory to save everyone now say it has uh, i mean to make the case simple uh, say it has two options. One is to swerve onto a jaywalking teen or teenager, okay, uh, and uh, crash on him or her, or divert the lane, okay, so that it saves its three elderly passengers. Now, what decision should the uh, autonomous vehicle take at this point? So you understand that the, uh, so this is, this is different from uh, a general machine learning or a general automatic decision, okay? Uh, the, the question is how to divide up the risk of harm between the different stakeholders on the road. So why is it difficult? Why is this question difficult? Why do you think is this question difficult? What is the issue? Any thoughts? No thoughts. So the point is that the harm that we are talking about here is inevitable. Okay, you cannot save everyone. Okay, that is the most important point. Okay. Somebody has an answer. Yeah, yeah, the 
even for humans, it is difficult to assess the relative harm. That's true. But why is this an issue in the first place? The issue is that harm in this case is absolutely inevitable. So you cannot actually go away without doing harm to someone. Okay? And how do you distribute this harm is also a difficult and challenging problem and actually includes the moral values, the cultural values, the societal structure uh, of like the of the um, country or the city in which the autonomous vehicle is operational okay and the so a, a typical argument could be that you know uh, why not one uh, be able to uh, apply asimov's three laws of robotics so the three laws of robotics are as follows so the first law states that so you have to you have to read these laws carefully so that we can you know so i'm sorry there was a disruption so the laws are as follows. So a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. So uh, if the robot is in action, it should not injure a human being or even by inaction, it should not allow a human being to be harmed. Okay, A robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. So a robot is going to obey the orders of human beings as long as the orders do not injure other human beings. Okay, so that's the idea. So uh, either by action or by inaction. And the third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or the second law. Okay? So basically, a robot will only think about its uh, own uh, existent or existence or protection of its own existence when they were the first and the second laws are secure. Okay? Fine, so these were the three laws stated by uh, Asimov. Now the question is, why does such laws uh, do not find applicability uh, in the context of autonomous vehicles. Say, for example, autonomous vehicles. Any thoughts? Any idea? Right. So the reason is this. So Asimov's law does not state what would happen when harm is inevitable. That the question that we posed earlier also, like if harm has to be done, then whom to harm? Okay. So either by action or by inaction, by any means you cannot avoid harm. Then what do you do? That's the question that Asimov's laws are unable to answer. And therefore the search for moral machines or how people would typically try to solve moral dilemmas in the context of their own societal, cultural and moral values. Okay. So uh, this led the authors to do a uh, interesting 
experiment called the moral machine experiment. So what do they do? So they set up a multilingual online but serious game. So this game is a serious game and uh, the participants are recruited in such a way so that they are quite serious in responding their, to, the, um, to the questions that this game needs to answer them. In, by means of this game, they collect large scale data on how citizens would want autonomous vehicles to solve moral dilemmas. Okay? So, and we will see that citizens of different parts of the world would typically want the autonomous vehicles to solve the moral dilemmas in different ways. That is very interesting, actually. So there is no universal uh, phenomena here. So, and of course, this is in the context of unavoidable accidents. Okay? Only when harm is inevitable, then how do you distribute this harm? Okay, that's the question that this experiment puts forward as a game in a game-like environment to its participants. Okay, so this game actually attracted a huge worldwide attention and the uh, authors were able to collect around uh, roughly 40 million decisions. And this spanned across 233 countries, dependencies and territories. So the respondents, where from different parts of the world, the red dots so show the concentration. Okay, so you see a uh, lot of respondents were from North America, quite a few from South America, large number of respondents from Europe, as well as a significant number of respondents from India. And the situations that they were presented with are like suggested in this picture. So suppose, an autonomous vehicle is on a track, on a lane, and there are some people crossing, okay? At this time, there is some sort of a brake fail. The uh, vehicle is out of control, okay? So what do the vehicle do? So there are two options. Okay? One is it can save its passengers by killing these people on the road, or it can actually divert the lane However, the lane is blocked here and it can bump on this concrete, thus killing all the passengers sitting in it. So which option is like, uh, is the car going to take? Is the autonomous vehicle uh, or the self-driving car, car going to uh, decide for? Okay, that's the question that was put forward um, uh, to the players of this game. Okay, and Based on the responses, the authors did a very interesting study. But then, uh, before we go there, uh, let's see what are the different ex accidental situ situations that the authors create. Okay, so uh, the accident scenarios uh, are as follows. They are, these are categorized into nine uh, different types. Okay and based on an exploration strategy. So uh, the first one says sparing humans versus spades. Okay, staying on course versus swerving. Sparing passengers versus pedestrians. Sparing more lives versus fewer lives. Sparing men versus women. Sparing the young versus the elderly. Sparing pedestrians who cross legally versus people who are jaywalking. Sparing the fit versus the less fit. Sparing those with higher social status versus those with lower social status. In addition, there were a few other uh, scenarios which were not part of this nine, where like uh, sparing criminals, pregnant women, or doctors, okay? So who were not linked to any of these nine other categories. Now, each respondent had to complete a 13 accident session, okay? So once they have completed these 13 accident sessions, the authors also collected survey about their demographics, okay? So they, they collected various demographic information like gender, age, income, education, etc., as well as their religious, religious attitude and political attitude, okay? So all these people were anonymized, 
So uh, there was uh, all the privacy uh, issues were uh, actually obeyed while collecting this data. So all these demographic data plus the religious as well as political attitude uh, were collected. In addition, their geolocation were collected. So these geolocations were used to cluster them to see what kind of uh, moral preferences actually prevail within certain geographical clusters. So that is what was the objective. Uh, that's why they also collected the geolocation and based on this geolocation, they did some clustering and these clustering uh, were uh, used later to actually identify the uh, homogeneity in the moral preferences across a geography. Okay. So first, they studied global preferences. Let's see what they did. So uh, they actually divided the uh, preferences into various parts, you know, like interventions. So interventions could be preference for action or preference for inaction. We will understand the plot later. So relation to autonomous vehicle, sparing passengers or sparing pedestrians. Gender, sparing males or sparing as opposed to sparing females. Fitness, sparing the large as opposed to sparing the fit. Social status, sparing lower status as opposed to sparing higher status. Law, sparing the unlawful as opposed to sparing the lawful. Age, sparing the elderly as opposed to sparing the young. Number of characters, sparing fewer characters as opposed to sparing more characters. Species, sparing pets as opposed to sparing humans. So these were the different categories in which they um, uh, divided the responses that they obtained. Now, preference is always in favor of the choice on the right side. Okay, so what does it mean? So it means when we define delta P. So delta P is the difference between the probability of sparing the characters on the right minus the probability of, uh, so it's the difference. So it's the probability of sparing the characters on the right and the probability of sparing the characters with the attribute on the left. So if there is a character probability of uh, probability of sparing a character, say uh, in preference for inaction, minus the probability of sparing the character with an attribute of action, okay? That is what you compute here. So this is the overall probability for inaction and the overall probability of action. And whatever you report here is the delta P, okay? So it's this right side minus the left side, fine? So now, as you see, there is more preference for inaction. So you read the uh, plot like this. There is more preference for act, uh, inaction than action. Okay. Then uh, there are some interesting ones like, so it is very interesting to observe that there is more preference in saving the young because it, it's a larger bar. Okay. So in sparing the young compared to sparing the elderly. So actually sparing the young is like 0.49 greater than the probability of sparing the older characters. So it's, it's pretty high. So this bar indicates the value. So similarly, sparing larger number of characters, this next one is more uh, favorable than sparing fewer characters. So this is a global aggregate, aggregate across the uh, global responses, okay? It's not countrywide. It's, it's all responses taken together, fine? So now they did a second set of experiments where they took the adult woman or adult man as the point of reference, okay? And now here delta P is the difference between the probability of a particular character when presented alone 
and the probability of sparing one adult man or adult woman. Okay. So delta P is the difference between the probability of sparing one of these characters that are listed here. Okay. And the probability of sparing one adult man or adult woman taken together. So that's the aggregate average of adult man and adult woman. And in comparison to that, the probability of sparing somebody listed here. So as you see, sparing strollers, girls, boys, young girls, boys, pregnant ladies, male doctors, female doctors, etc. These are actually having a positive delta P. So they, it's a higher, there is a higher chance. And in fact, for the strollers, girls, boys, etc., there is a much higher chance that they will be spared compared to an adult man or woman. Again, this is on aggregate level. However, on the other side, like if you have a um, dog or a criminal or a uh, or for instance, a homeless or an old man, then the probability of sparing them compared to an adult man or an adult woman is lesser. It's negative, actually. Yeah, so that's what I was telling. So sparing a girl compared to a, an adult woman or an adult man is like 0.15 higher. Probability. Any questions so far? Any questions? Otherwise, we'll proceed. Okay. So now, as I said, the authors also collected geographical locations, geolocations of the users. Based on these geolocations, they did something more interesting. So what they did was they tried to obtain a hierarchical clustering of uh, uh, these uh, users based on their geolocation. Now, in doing so, 130 countries got considered because they had at least 100 respondents. Okay, If some country had less, than, so as you saw, we started off with 233 countries, but then out of them, only 130 countries had at least 100 respondents. So respondents. And therefore, the authors went on to work on with this uh, 130 countries, okay, to have at least have some mini minimum meaningful statistics, okay, and they construct a nice dendrogram, and the branches of the dendrogram actually are um, clustered into three large clusters, as we will see soon: Western, Eastern, and Southern, okay, and country names are colored according to some cultural map. Okay, some standard cultural map. So this is the very nice dendrogram that they illustrate. So there is a southern region, there is an eastern region, southern region is marked in blue, sorry, in green. The eastern region is marked in uh, haze blue and the western region is marked in purple. Okay, And then there are other colors. These colors actually indicate different types of uh, you know, religious bearings, etc. So, uh, so what what do you see? What are the eastern? What is the eastern color composed of mostly, or the eastern cluster composed of? Do you see some pattern in the three clusters? Eastern, western, and southern. Any patterns that you observe? Asian countries. Yes, that is the eastern part. So Anirban says Asian countries that composes uh, the eastern part. The southern part, mostly European countries.
Very good. So Eastern is composed of primarily Islamic and Confucian beliefs. Yes, Soham is very correct. The Eastern part has a lot of uh, Islamic and Confucian beliefs. Okay. These are the overall large uh, observations. So the Eastern consists of mostly countries of Islamic and Confucian cultures. Western has large percentages of Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox countries in the Europe. Okay. That is what is the Western is composed of. Now, based on these clusters, the authors do some more interesting studies. First thing that they do is they do a radar plot. So where they actually uh, compute the z-scores of the different probability values that you saw in the previous slide. Okay. And from these z-scores, so uh, you see the radar plot has different uh, labels on different uh, sides of the circle. Okay. So like preference for inaction, sharing, um, uh, sorry, sparing pedestrians, uh, then sparing females, sparing the feet, etc., etc. And they are trying to study the radar plot for the western, eastern, and the southern zones. Okay, and you see some interesting distinguishing characteristics. Can you tell me some of them? Some interesting characteristics that we observe. Southern has much less preference for sparing humans. Yes, true. Anything else? Any other observation? Okay, let me summarize it for you. Okay, so these are the main observations and even more important observation is hidden, which I'll again ask. Southern has more preference for sparing females. Very good. So Kunal has given a very nice answer. That is one of the primary observations that we have from uh, this particular radar plot. So, um, so, some of the most important characterizations is that preference to spare younger characters compared to older. This is less pronounced in the Eastern cl cl cluster and more pronounced in the Southern cluster. So in the Southern cluster, sparing younger characters compared to older characters is more pronounced. Okay, As you understand in the Eastern culture, we are actually um, like, most of the times uh, we would tend to uh, spare the uh, elder citizens. So this is again a cultural difference that is understandable. Okay. Similar goes, uh, statement goes for sparing higher status characters. Okay. So in the uh, Eastern culture, it's less pronounced, whereas in the Western, sorry, Southern culture, it's more pronounced. Okay. So there is a weaker preference to spare humans over pets in the southern cl uh, cluster. So these are like uh, many European countries and here actually pets are very, very coveted possession. And therefore this observation I would guess. And then as Kunal rightly pointed out, there are strong preferences in the southern cl cluster to spare females as well as to spare fit characters. Okay. So these are very typical feature of the southern cluster. Okay. So the authors do some more interesting study. That is, they do some country-wise analysis and let's see what they have done here. So the uh, uh, purple dots okay, uh, indicate cluster one or the western cluster. The blue ones indicate cluster two or the 
eastern cluster and the green ones indicate the cluster 3 or the southern cluster okay so this is how you should read the points uh, on these plots so in the first plot the uh, authors show the correlation between individualism and sparing more characters so certain cultures are no, known to be individualistic culture okay and some certain cultures are known to be more collectivistic in nature okay so if you uh, dissociate cultures based on individualism and um, sparing the uh, number of characters then you observe a plot like this and what do you see what is the observation What is the observation? So individualistic cultures actually spare more characters. So if you are an individualistic culture, then you would tend to spare more characters, okay? Compared to a single character on the road. Then look at the inset, okay? Here again, you plot individualism versus sparing the young. And what do you see here? Now, since I have told you how to read this plot, you should be able to read this plot. Individualism versus sparing the young. What do you observe? It's easy to see, right? So, cultures that actually are less individualistic and more collectivistic tend to spare elderly people more than the younger ones. Okay, see the blue points. So, cultures which are like more collectivistic in nature and less individualistic they tend to save the elderly generation compared to the younger ones. So these are the two interesting observations that you see. So in individualistic cultures, people tend to or prefer to spare greater number of characters and in collectivistic cultures, people tend to have a weaker preference to sparing younger characters okay, compared to elderly characters. Now look at this one. This is again an interesting plot. So on the uh, x-axis, the authors plot the log of GDP per capita. Okay? And on the y-axis, the authors plot sparing the lawful. So those who are legally crossing the road compared to those who are actually jaywalking or unlawful. So whom do you spare? So GDP versus sparing the lawful. And what do you see here? This should be easy to interpret.
No idea. Yeah, countries with higher GDP have a higher affinity to spare the lawful. True. So uh, that, that is what Manasvi says. And I, we would rather interpret it in uh, this way that weaker, poorer countries typically suffer from weaker institutions. Okay. And therefore are more tolerant to pedestrians who cross illegally. So that is what is kind of coming up very clearly. Look at the points here. Okay, people who are typically less lawful are actually spared more if you are like, you know, uh, from a poorer country because the uh, entire legal institution in most of these countries are kind of weak. Okay, and therefore you uh, tend to spare the individuals who are even illegal. The next set of plots that the authors make are also very interesting. So they did a US centric study where what they wanted to see is that if some country is culturally similar to the US, then does the moral machine properties or the moral machine observations from that country on an aggregate level also correlate with this cultural distance? And what they observe is that countries which are culturally more similar to the US, okay, have more similar moral machine properties. Okay, so basically, if a country is, so there are different cultural indicators by which you can measure how culturally close two countries are, okay? Now, if you try to find out the cultural difference, between, cultural distance between US and any other country, you can use these metrics. Now, these metrics are plotted on the x-axis, whereas on the y-axis, you plot the aggregate level um, moral machine, um, uh, features for the two countries, one on one side US and the other side, uh, the uh, country in question, the query country. And now you compute something like a cosine distance. Okay, and you plot this distance versus distance uh, graph. And what you observe that if a country is culturally similar to US, then people there play the moral machine game very similar to that of the playing uh, behavior followed in the US. Okay. The last plot again is very interesting. The status plot is not that revealing I would say but the last plot is again very interesting. So in places where you find less devaluation of women's lives in health and birth, males are seen more expendable in moral machine decision making. Okay? So countries which have less devaluation or are more protective about their women health and uh, women birth rights. Okay? So in those countries, people tend to actually spare So the countries that uh, typically uh, have more like uh, protective uh, rights for women re related to their health and uh, birth, um, those countries tend to spare their women population okay, at the cost of their male population as, as per the moral decision making uh, game results okay so uh, this is in a nutshell what the authors did in this paper and 
they have some interesting follow up works also if you are interested you can go ahead and uh, have a look at those uh, but um, in a nutshell uh, i find that this is a very uh, nice uh, initial work which makes people think about how machines are going to actually distribute harm whenever they are uh they are like all pervasive okay for instance autonomous vehicles can can some policies or moral policies be evolved based on these results will these moral policies be questions like will these moral policies be country specific culture specific okay uh, population distribution specific because some countries might have a skewed uh, population um, where you have less youth compared to more um, elderly uh, population some countries might be the opposite so depending on the population structure depending on the um, uh, political status depending on the financial status economic uh, growth of the country will all these matter in the uh, framing of the moral policies so that's a question that's an interesting question that this kind of work puts forward and we are we still as uh, professor uh, dubey was also uh, telling in his lecture we are still not in a position to fully uh, understand and comprehend what is going to happen but it's a good start and people all over the world are Uh, working on these kind of problems uh, so there is this whole new branch of policy regulations that have come in so basically which policies do you uh, actually um, subscribe to so the idea is that uh, with uh, so much of expertise in, in uh, game theory and things like that can computer scientists come on board and help emerge policies given the environmental societal cultural political economic uh, status of a country okay. so that's a huge gamut of things called policy regul regulations and it's it's a field in itself there are quite a bit of work that have already been done uh, and if you are interested write to me i'll be happy to share more data uh, on this uh, and i hope uh, you enjoyed uh, at least some parts of the course if not the full some some parts were uh, at least relevant uh, to you and you found interesting and i hope some of these will also come handy in uh, in a uh, higher academic career uh, which some of you are planning to pursue so uh, any questions usually i offer a coffee to all the students present on the last day uh, of the course unfortunately cannot do it this time but this remains a due once we pass over this situation uh, we will definitely have the coffee any further questions okay so as discussed we will have um, a, a quick chat with all the groups regarding their term assignments on uh, april 15 so this is not an evaluation but just a stock check as to where you are okay and uh, uh, all the group members should be present um, and uh, there is one pending group uh, for the mid sem evaluations we will let them know uh sometime soon when we will do the mix and evaluation for them so all these will be done through zoom 
um, for the time being. Okay, thank you very much students.